our, our second uh, talk in this session is on distributed programming using raw parametric session types in Go. Uh, there's multiple authors, and the speaker is going to be Sun. Youngmans, and I'm going to talk about distributed programming using role parametric session types in Go. Um, the first half of the talk will uh, consist roughly about um, uh, some of the issues that Go programmers face when you want to develop distributed applications in Go. And then after that, I'll explain how role parametric session types, which is uh, the key contribution of this work, uh, how role parametric session types can help them. So generally, I think our group, our team, has been working on the development of theory and tools to help programmers write safe concurrent programs for a long time now, where safety could, for instance, mean deadlock-free. And in recent years, we've been using this research, uh, in particular in the context of the Go programming language. Now, Go is a very interesting language for us for a number of reasons. So first of all, it's a modern, um, popular systems language, so there are potentially a lot, a lot of users. Second, concurrency has been one of the primary design features of the Go language from its inception. Um, so there is you know, good support for lightweight threads, but also channel-based concurrency, which is very close to the formal models that we've been studying. And finally, last but not least, Go users indicated in a recent survey that although they appreciate Go's concurrency features a lot, at the same time, they also struggle to debug the usages of those features effectively. And so the idea of this, of this research, of this work, was to see if we can use multi-party session types to make the lives of Go programmers a little bit easier in this respect. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce some of the main challenges that distributed Go programmers face. And I'd like to do that by means of an example. It's called HTCAT. HTCAT is an existing real-world third-party application um, and it's essentially a modern version of curl. So it allows users to you know, download web pages, essentially. Uh, but the interesting thing here is, is that internally it works, it works in parallel. So there's some parallel components there. And this is where HTCAT derives much of its strong performance from. Now, in previous work, we tried to apply post-factum verification techniques to uh, establish the safety of HTCAT. But this turned out to be very difficult to the extent that we actually didn't really manage to do that. And so the idea for this work was to see if we can use an alternative sort of uh, correctness by construction approach to construct our own version of uh, a HDCAT that is sort of safe by construction. And we'll call this version PGET. Now, let me very briefly explain to you how this HDCAT or PGET program works. So on this slide, you see all the parallel components of the program. Uh, we have a master that's essentially the entry point of the application. Then we have a bunch of fetchers who are responsible for the actual download work and the server who hosts the file. Now, just by looking at this, at this picture, we can already identify the first core feature of this program, namely the fact that the number of fetches is determined dynamically at runtime. And so if you want to implement this program, definitely you need to support runtime parameterization in the number of fetchers. Now, the master and the fetchers, they run locally on your own machine but the server runs remotely. And this means that the master and the fetchers, they can communicate with each other using Go's native channels that go across shared memory, whereas the fetchers and the server, they need to communicate across a network using TCP channels. And this brings us to the second core feature of uh, this program, namely the fact that as a programmer, you need to deal with mixed communication transports, right? Shared memory on the one hand, TCP on the other. And this is problematic because uh, the way to access these uh, uh, different uh, communication transports is through disparate programming abstractions. And so when you want to reason about the communication protocol between these components, um, well, essentially, you cannot do that in a uniform vocabulary. You need to uh, use these disparate abstractions. So the program then works as follows. First, the master needs to acquire a bit of metadata, namely the size of the file. And because the master doesn't have a direct communication link to the server, it needs to do this through one of the fetchers. And so what first happens is that a get size message is communicated from the master to the first fetcher. Then the first fetcher will relay this message as an HTTP request with some binary payload to the server. Uh, the server will send back a response, and then finally the first fetcher will you know, parse the data and send an integer back to the master. 
And then once the master knows the size of the file, it can divide the total download work evenly among all the fetchers. The fetchers can then, in parallel, but individually, perform the actual HTTP request for the data. Um, the server will send back the data, the fetchers parse it, and send it back to the master. This is essentially how it works. But what's interesting now is that in this last series of communications from the fetchers to the master, not only do the fetchers send back the data, but they also send a fresh set of channels, where the idea is that in the next round of fetching, so assuming that you want to fetch another web page, in the next round of fetching, the fetchers and the master, they use a new set of channels discarding the old ones. And this brings us to the third core feature of PGET, namely the fact that this program actually uses uh, the higher orderness of channels in Go, right? You actually use channel passing. And this was already the case in the original HTCAT program. And this makes the post-factum verification particularly challenging. This was one of the main reasons why we weren't able to do that. So this is essentially how this program works. But then there's another feature, actually, that I should mention here, namely the fact that this first fetcher, even though it is logically a fetcher, it is somehow a distinguished one because it also engages in this first series of communications to get the size of the file. And so we call this phenomenon role heterogeneity, meaning that even if you have a parallel component and logically they play the same role, um, this does not necessarily mean that they have identical communication behavior. And again, this complicates reasoning about these kinds of protocols. So to summarize, we have this quite complex set of features that we need to support. And on top of that, as a programmer, you also need to establish a number of safety, safety properties, right? We definitely want to have deadlock freedom, but also something like protocol compliance. So we want to be sure that the processes in this case, um, they do not engage in communication actions that they're not supposed to do. Now, Go does not provide any language support to help programmers reason about those kinds of safety requirements, but multi-party session types do. And so the idea was that maybe we can use multi-party session types um, to develop these kinds of real-world complicated programs. But at the same time, when we started this work, we already knew that at that time, multi-party session types uh, were not really capable of doing that because a number of these features were not properly supported, notably parametrization and role heterogeneity. And so the key point of this work was to extend the multi-party session type theories and implementations to be able to support these kinds of real-world programs. Now, before I give you a, a concrete list of the contributions, let me very briefly explain how this multi-party session types works. Uh, I think Bernardo already, already explained it a little bit in the previous talk. Um, essentially, assume that we have this set of processes here, W1, 2, and 3, and we want to establish the safety of these processes. The first thing we do, as Bernardo also explained, is we write a global type. And this global type is essentially the specification of you know, the communication protocol from this global perspective. So on the right-hand side, you see a very simple example. W1 first communicates an integer to W2, and then W2 communicates a Boolean to W3. So in this case, the processes, the WIs, they're essentially organized in a pipeline. Okay? Now, once we have the global type, we can mechanically infer from this global type a set of local types where each of these local types uh, specifies the communication behavior of each of the processes from its local perspective. Right? So uh, the local type for W1 has to say that W1 first needs to send an integer to W2, and the local type for W2 says that it first needs to receive an integer from W1 and then send a Boolean to W3. Then once you have these, global, these local types, you can type check your processes against them. And now the key property of this multi-party session types framework is that if all your processes are well typed, then the parallel composition of these processes is protocol compliant and deadlock free. Now what's also important to emphasize at this point is I think the modularity of this whole framework. So once you have your local types, you can really verify your processes against them in a you know, isolated modular fashion. And this is very important when you do distributed programming where you want to decouple your endpoints as much as possible. So the concrete contributions of this work then are that we added to this classical MPST theory that I explained on the previous slide, parametrization and role heterogeneity. Then we implemented this theory as an extension to the Scribble protocol language. And then finally, we did an evaluation where we had a look at the performance of our implementation as well as the expressiveness of, uh, well, everything we, uh, we, we, we developed here. So in the rest of the talk, let me just clarify some of these contributions, starting with the theory. And I'd like to focus in particular on the role heterogeneity part, just in the interest of time. So imagine that we want to extend this three-man pipeline that we saw uh, a few slides ago into a generic, per parameterized pipeline consisting of an arbitrary number of workers. 
Now, this is how you would write it in our, uh, well, in our global type syntax. Essentially, we add just two elements to this, to this, uh, to this global type language. First, we allow roles to be indexed with i and j in this case. And second, we add this for each construct, which allows you to loop over indexed roles. This is essentially a kind of MPST-oriented version of the loops uh, that you uh, typically have in uh, other languages. Um, now, when it comes to this role heterogeneity, the key question at this point is how can we infer from this global type that there exists, in fact, three different role variants, right? Uh, we have the first worker, then we have a bunch of middle workers, and we have the last worker, okay? How can we infer this? Now, the key um, insight to do this is to observe that the communication behavior of a worker X is actually fully determined by the intervals in the for each headers that contain X. So in other words, if you have two workers, X and Y, and X and Y are contained in exactly the same intervals, then worker X and worker Y must have exactly the same communication behavior. So applied to this example, uh, we have the following. For instance, X could be in the red interval, which runs from 1 to N minus 1, and it could be in the blue interval, which runs from 2 to N, which means that X has to be between 2 and N minus 1, and logically we have then identified the middle worker. Right? X could also be in the red interval, but not in the blue interval, in which case X has to be 1, in which case we logically identify a first worker. And in the same way, we can also identify the last worker. So generally, what we do is we, ident so we analyze the intervals that occur in the global type, then we consider a bunch of cases, and in this way, you can, in a decidable way, infer all these role variants. And then once you have the role variants, you can define your projection operator in terms of them, uh, which in this case gives us three local types, one for, the, uh, for all the uh, middle workers, one for the first worker, and one for the last worker. Okay? Now the, theor the theorems that we then prove is that inference of role variants is decidable. Uh, checking well-foldness uh, of parameterized global types is decidable as well. And then our correctness theorem states that if you project a well-formed global type, then essentially you preserve the semantics of your global type. And this is enough for the purpose that we need. So then we implemented this uh, theory as an extension to the Scribble protocol language. Um, and the Scribble protocol language is supported by the Scribble uh, toolchain. And this toolchain essentially um, supports the multi-party session types uh, workflow or methodology that I explained earlier in the talk. So you as a programmer, you write your parameterized global type, then you feed it to the toolchain. The toolchain will then do the projection for you, it will compute your local types, and it will output a representation of these local types as APIs. Right? So you will generate one API for every local type that you have. And then the idea is that you as a programmer, if you want to implement a process, you use the generated API. If you do that in a well-typed way, then you get the multi-party session type uh, guarantees. Now, to make this a bit more concrete, let me show you a very brief demo video to show you how it works. So here you see uh, uh, the representation of the parameterized pipeline in the, in the Scribble language. You also see at the top three other files, first.go, middle.go, and last.go, these contain the process implementations right, for, for the workers. Now, right now, they're still a bit, uh, they still contain errors because I haven't generated the code yet, so there's still some dependencies missing. But if I click on this button, um, then the APIs will be generated, and at least the errors in first.go and last.go will go away. But we still have one in middle.go. And essentially, this error tells us that uh, we haven't implemented a process for the middle worker properly yet. And apparently, this is something that the type checker can catch. And the reason it can catch this is because this function, which is supposed to implement comprehensively this middle worker, goes from an initial state to an end state, but we're not producing the end state yet. Okay? So these states, essentially the way to look at your global, or one way to look at your local types is to perceive them as state machines, where transitions of the state machine correspond to um, communication actions that a process in a certain state of the protocol is allowed to perform. And so under this sort of operational interpretation of your local types, uh, essentially what you need to do to implement your process is to just fire transitions until you reach a final state. And the generated APIs support this by having a separate method for each of the uh, 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 transitions. So you just need to call methods of the, uh, of the API. So if we want to implement this, well, we start with this S1, of course, the initial state. And we know that in the initial state, the middle worker can only receive from its predecessor. And what's very interesting now is that um, the auto-completion function of my IDE will actually guide me towards using the right method functions uh, that have been uh, generated in this API. So uh, the API is only one method in S1, namely to receive from the predecessor, and the IDE helps me to select this one. 
Now, then we have the successor state, S2. In this state, we can only send to our successor, and again, um, the uh, um, autocompleter of the uh, IDE tells me exactly what I need to do. Um, then finally, I can uh, return this, uh, uh, this S3 state, the final state. I can try to rebuild the application, and then the errors, uh, they go away, and I can just run it. Okay, so this is, in a very tiny nutshell, how this uh, implementation works from a user perspective. So, um, right. So what are implementation guarantees is, first of all, correct index management, which has been completely internalized in the, in the generated API, which is actually very nice because it's a common source of errors. Right, so that's something that programmers do not need to think about anymore. In addition to that, we also have protocol compliance and deadlock freedom up to a number of, uh, I would say, standard assumptions uh, in multi-party session type implementations. For instance, if your program contains an infinite loop that is outside or unrelated to your communications, well, then we, we cannot guarantee deadlock freedom. And we achieve this just through uh, native Go type checking, and also we have a bunch of lightweight runtime checks for linearity, although there are also other styles of APIs that we can generate where you don't even have those runtime checks. So we also did an evaluation, uh, that, which consists of two parts. First, we had a look at the performance of the whole uh, framework. Uh, and here we essentially compared the performance of generated APIs against handwritten optimized uh, communication code. Um, so when you look at the graphs, essentially y equals, or the closer the colored lines are to y equals one, um, the more similar we perform to the handwritten code. Uh, so I think this looks pretty good. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, let's say, the relative performance. But if you look at the absolute performance, then in the worst case, we're about 20 nanoseconds slower for a single communication, which is often negligible in uh, real world um, ap uh, applications. Then on the expressiveness side, we also, uh, we also did an evaluation there where we basically just looked at a lot of examples. Um, number nine is pget, the running example of, uh, or the motivating example in the talk. We also did the pipeline. We did 19 others as well. I have to refer to the paper for uh, uh, the details. What else is in the paper? Well, we have some more details on the, uh, on the language of global types that we have. Uh, we have some more implementation details. For instance, we also have transport independence. So we provide programmers a uniform interface uh, uh, that they can use to uh, use both TCP and shared memory, which was also an important uh, feature of this PGET program. And then there's a technical report with even more details. Um, I think this is everything I wanted to say. This is just a slide with the contributions again as a summary. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Great. Uh, as, as before, we'll start with questions from Slido. So um, do, I'm keeping track here so you can put my questions in. Um, the first one, um, I'll just read this out. Yeah. Why do you want to deliver role heterogene heterogeneity? I think it is an ad hoc programming feature that should be excluded. Huh, okay. Um, yeah, so for us it was actually pretty important because of the modularity thing. I don't know where to, uh, in the camera, uh, I, for, so for uh, the modularity <laughs> thing. So as I explained in, the, uh, in one of the earlier slides, one of the key things of multi-party session types is that you have this modular nature, right? So you want to decouple your distributed endpoints as, as much as possible. And if you want to sort of maximize this in a parameterized setting, then you really need to identify the, 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 uh, the role variance. Because, um, I mean, you cannot, because you don't know how many, for instance, in the worker example, you cannot know how many workers you have statically. So you cannot generate a local type for each of your workers in the pipeline. But if you generate only one local type for all the possible worker communication behavior that you have, um, then you, well, you lose the decoupling between the first worker, the middle workers, and the last worker. So essentially, it's about decoupling. That, that's why we want to have role heterogeneity. OK. Um, we, oh, we have another question. We have another question on, uh, on, on Slido. Um, how do you deal with replication in the global type? With replication? With replication. What That's kind of replication? I am not sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, process replication. Well, I, w I mean, we can... I mean, if, if replication means sending, like, you know, uh, the same value to a number of replicated processes, or not even the same value of the same type to a number of, of processes, then, well, we can do it. So we can express in the global type uh, that you send the message 
it's basically like a, like a scatter pattern. A scatter pattern. You send a message to uh, a number of processes which are, you know, have the same communication behavior, and then uh, they're replicated. So, but I, I'm not sure if this is okay. Well, but yeah. okay, yeah. It's just it's starting a conversation. Um, the uh, is there anyone in the room who'd like to ask a question? So the question is, did you compare the original version that motivated and you couldn't verify with the new one that you propose in some way? Uh, you mean like the behavior of, of the programs? Yes. Um, yes, we did. And they are almost the same. They're almost, but not quite. So in, your, in the original version, um, and this is actually part of our future work, in your or original version, you can let depend um, the number of fetchers that you have that could depend on the value that you receive from the, uh, from the, from the server. So it could depend on the size. Uh, whereas for us, uh, that is uh, currently not possible, but we're trying to work right now on uh, letting or allowing the protocol to be dependent on the value also that you return or that you get during the session. Yeah. I have one more question from Slido and then Dominic. Uh, well, it's, how good are the error messages the, the, the person asks, given that Z3 is used to discharge checks. Yes. It's a kind of usability true. question about using the tool. Right. So uh, we're not exposing Z3 or the output of Z3 directly to the user. Uh, essentially, we use Z3 for very simple, well, for relatively sim simple checks on the, on the intervals. So for instance, we want to know that uh, the interval in a for each header is never empty. So it's very simple things. OK. All right, uh, we're out of time. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.